Now this has always been a very good uh, skiing area. The shape of the mountain, the character, the angle of the slopes uh, is very special. This run in Corrie Cass, for example, has a very flattering angle and is very, very popular with intermediate skiers and even good skiers alike. It's the largest area, yeah. really. Plus it's available. The, yeah, and the roads are a lot uh, better than, say, to the yeah. other resorts. It only takes us six and a half hours to get here rather than going somewhere else. Well, we'd like to see the area extended and more lifts put in. No. Also, they could um, stop so many people coming on the hill, you know, that would help a lot. We have a, uh, an uphill capacity of 10,500 per hour, which can accommodate uh, probably about 6,000 people. That would be maximum. It's not so bad once you're on the mountain, up here. It's pretty good. It's about 20 minute wait at the moment. But it, it's quiet today, so what's it like on a busy day? If the queues are really bad and it takes two hours on a queue, then you only get, say, six hours skiing and then you only get three runs down the mountain. And for £7.50, it's, it's just a waste of time, really. Here now, it's so congested that the skiing is dangerous. There are so many people skiing on the pistes. The pistes are fairly narrow. There are folks falling, somebody else skis into them because they can't avoid them, and uh, I think it's high time that uh, the ski area as a whole was expanded. I mean, I know there's a lot of nature conservationists against building new ski areas, but the amount of area around the Highland region compared to the number of mountains that are skiable, I'm sure that a bit, a bit extra pinched towards the skiers wouldn't make that much difference. At the moment, when the car parks are full, we are working to capacity. We're, we tend to be slightly stretched then. And there are people being turned away at the bottom gate. It's a success story. And part of its problem is, obviously, is success. And what a success. On a busy day, there can be seven times as many skiers as originally intended. And these slopes are unsuitable now for almost any other mountain activity. There is one ptarmigan left. It's a concrete one the restaurant at the top of the ski lift. We're in Coy Cass here, which is the original area that was developed for skiing in Cairngorm in the early 60s. And in the early years, a lot of the damage here was caused by tractors because they, that was the cheapest way to put in the ski toes. New ski toes here now are, and at other ski developments are put in by helicopter and they don't do this amount of damage. We also now have roads in Coy Cass for the vehicles to go on and to channel people. So the damage has gone down. But some of the scars from the early days are still there. And the reason for that is that the climate here is so severe and the soils are so thin and the plant recovery is so slow that some of the scars done can last for decades. Once you have the vegetation destroyed or damaged, then you get uh, a series of problems because the soil gets washed out. You begin to get rails like this here washed out here it's about five inches deep the grit that's come out of this hole has gone down on top of vegetation further down and that gradually buries it and kills it very good example of half buried heather here another bit here the ski company is concerned about this and so are all ski companies and rightly so because uh, if you don't have vegetation on a ski slope, soon there will not be a piece for skiing on because the soil would wash away, you get rocks beginning to come out and no longer a smooth surface to ski on. There are other problems because uh, if you get severe erosion, this can threaten roads, it can threaten the bases of pylons, it could threaten buildings. Because it, there have been severe floods here in the past and other ski developments which threaten the facilities themselves. Thirdly, you've got the aesthetic point of view, which the ski companies increasingly are paying attention to, and this is that it looks bad. The dense concentration of downhill skiing has damaged the vegetation and frightened away the wildlife, as well as disfiguring the mountain. But there are plans to extend the facilities substantially in an area west of the existing development. The scheme was rejected by the Secretary of State after a prolonged public inquiry eight years ago. But the ski company, backed by the Highlands and Islands Development Board, are still pressing on, in spite of the fact that the area they want is now protected under the 1981 Wildlife and Countryside Act. 
So how much expansion would they like? We'd be able to go as far as uh, Lurcher's Gully and uh, the lower snow fields. In which, terms of numbers, what is that? Uh, probably an increase of, now I'm guessing from the top of my head, uh, somewhere in the region of 30-40% over our existing numbers. When we put a, our first proposal uh, forward to go that, in that direction, uh, there was opposition to that particular proposal and uh, that was for a two-lane road and a large car park in Koyanakis. Now, that is the ideal way to do it from a skier's point of view. However, I can understand people not liking that type of thing and there were objections. Uh, but we, since then, we have modified our plans accordingly. The modified plans now mean just a single track road to the projected ski area but it would still mean a mass invasion into a wild landscape supposedly protected by law. Many people here and abroad think this move into Lurcher's Gully would be a mistake. The area has been shown a number of times as being of international significance in conservation terms and we feel that it's, it's not appropriate for uh, a considerable part of this area to be given over to one uh, recreational interest, particularly when that interest demands mechanical facilities on the hill. Uh, secondly, we're very concerned about the concentration of uh, downhill skiing facilities in one place in Scotland. We don't think this is the best way to proceed uh, for two main reasons. Firstly, we feel that uh, such development, if it is to go ahead, uh, should benefit a wider range of communities. And we have at the present two schemes, both with full planning permission, and we feel that uh, those should be allowed to proceed before there's any further expansion at Cairngorm, because they're bound to have uh, an effect on the demand here. Thirdly, uh, we can only see this development into Lurcher's Gully as a rather dangerous arm of a pincer reaching out across the northern corries. And once that development is in place, uh, we feel that inevitably, in the course of time, and despite the Chairlifts Company's own uh, development plan, from the downhill skiing fraternity, there are bound to be calls for, for further development in the two main corries in between Corrie Cass and Lurcher's, and that, that would really worry us. I think uh, that the, the company will not want to go further in that direction than Lurcher's Gully. I know that there is a kind of last-ditch uh, mentality, feeling that this development is going to go on uh, spreading indefinitely. That, uh, that is not the case as far as I'm concerned. It's been recognised internationally as being of, of very high conservation significance for a large number of years, uh, and there have been repeated calls on the British government to, to safeguard it. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, called on the British government in 1981 to ensure the conservation of the Cairngorms. They regarded it as that important. There are other uh, very similar areas just, just alongside the areas that are where the skiing is concentrated. So we are talking about less than, uh, well, just, just a little over 1% of the total area where the skiers are concentrated. We're not looking at an area which is 1% of anything. We, we are looking at an area which is 100% of itself. I mean, uh, is he saying that if I went to the Scottish National Gallery and cut off 1% of all the paintings in there, nobody would mind? I do believe there is a case for a modest extra development uh, in this very huge area where there is still a huge amount of space left for conservation. What I want to achieve is some sensible balance, which I think has not yet quite been reached. But conflict in the Cairngorms isn't restricted to the mountain slopes. Much of the lower land is covered with ancient forest. It's one of the few areas with Britain's original vegetation more or less intact. Bird watchers come from all over the world to see the spectacular rarities like the Capacali. The ancient Caledonian forest is also base for the Scottish crossbill, which has evolved an extra large bill to cope with the tough cones of Scots pines. A natural forest contains a high proportion of trees past their prime. Dead and dying timber, amongst a good carpet of heather and bilberry for winter cover, are the exacting requirements of our rarest tit. The delightful crested tit was widespread once, but as the old pine forest was cleared, so its distribution became restricted. Now it's mainly found in a few remnants of the primeval forest that once covered Britain. Many birds feed on insects, which are a vital part of the forest ecosystem. 
and since hundreds of insect species are dependent on dead and decaying wood, even limited cutting and removal of timber can have knock-on effects for the whole system. This land belongs to the Forestry Commission. Over 40 years ago they declared it a forest park, where conservation was to be a priority. But they continued to cut down native pines and replace them with foreign tree species, planted in square blocks. Over much of the area, the habitat for the rare birds and insects has been completely destroyed. Within the native pine parts of the forest, we're only planting native species, but within the rest of the forest where the, pine has, the native pine has now disappeared, um, we feel that there's an opportunity here to give timber production a higher profile and to use the species that are most productive for the site. But should there be commercial timber production anywhere in Glenmore Park? The Forestry Commission was set up primarily to grow timber. Are they really the best people to look after this valuable piece of our heritage? The 1981 Wildlife and Countryside Act placed a, a statutory duty on the Commission to achieve a reasonable balance between timber production and conservation. Now, up to that time, foresters always had been interested in conservation. Really, forestry is, is applied ecology, so foresters have to be ecologists to do their job. But the change in, in that act meant that we were able to put much more positive management into our conservation and to take a more active part in conservation in the forest. In most places of this kind of quality abroad, the natural forest would have been allowed to develop without having this kind of forestry. Now, this doesn't mean that forestry is bad in a place like that. It means that the type of forestry which perhaps should go on there is not that sort. I don't agree with any planting at all in the native pine woods because the main reason for them being valuable is that they have naturally regenerated themselves for eight, nine thousand years. Therefore, the planting of even Scots pine is something which is not desirable. They are destroying a very rare habitat in order to grow trees which can be grown perfectly well in other areas which are not so rare and valuable. But who is to stop them? The statutory body responsible for conservation is the Nature Conservancy Council. Yet over much of the area the big landowners largely order their own priorities. The neighbouring property, Rothy Mercus, has been in the Grant family for centuries. Part of the estate is within the National Nature Reserve and John Grant sees himself as being on the side of conservation, up to a point. I think what you've got to remember is that nature conservation and conservation are, is, is a productive term. It isn't a preservation and a leave it alone term. And whereas I, as an owner, am perfectly happy to lease a large area of our wonderful Rothiomachus forest to the general public. I don't think the general public would even consider that it should no longer have the timber felled within it over the long term. I may be proved wrong, but at the moment it is policy to continue to fell timber. And felling Caledonian pines is a lucrative sideline on John Grant's land. Loch Allen has, uh, for 30 years or so, now been treated as a place which people are actually encouraged to resort to. It's a particularly beautiful place to come to, and there's a very good footpath around it, uh, so that it is a place where people can come to in fairly large numbers, without being aware of each other, and enjoy this wonderful natural environment. Over this area, we have a nature reserve agreement and part of that nature reserve agreement is the provision of a visitor center. So we actually do it, obviously we use outside consultants for that sort of work and uh, the Nature Conservancy assists us with the finance of it as well. Today many visitors are well informed about conservation issues and an increasing number are eager to learn more while they're here. What makes this area special? It's really just a rather peculiar geographical uh, occurrence, if you like. In this part of the main Cairngorms range, there are no foothills. So, what happens is, you face straight on to about a group of the highest mountains in Scotland, including Cairngorm. 
And here also, in this area, you have got this great loch, Loch Morley. Now, Loch Morley is an interesting loch in itself and has certain features of value. It's got a beach, and this gives it, a, along with its fringe of pines, gives it enormous tourist value. Sailing had been quite a long tradition on the loch for local people, and um, we thought it would be high-minded of the Forestry Commission to say that had to stop. While some people might think that the, that detracts from the landscape of a Highland loch, it does give pleasure to thousands of visitors, and we don't allow motorboats, um, just power by sail, and we feel that that fits into the forest setting. But there's a price to pay. Planning permission allowed facilities to be built along the shore of Loch Morlich. There are now two bases for sailing, a small jetty, an artificial beach and litter. It's certainly changed since the 1940s when W.A. Poucher wrote, Loch Morlich is the gem of the range and it's enhanced by the trees fringing the shore. At that time, many wading birds nested here, including the rare Temminck stint. But recent studies show that most of these birds have now gone. I don't think it has been spoiled. We still get tremendous numbers of visitors coming to see the loch. It's magical scenery. It's really beautiful. The forest surrounding it, the Cairngorms beyond, and the loch shimmering in the centre. Yes, there are a lot of people come to see it. There's a lot of pressure on the loch. Um, and we can't keep people away from it. It's, it's somewhere they do want to see. And since the ski road has been built, numbers have increased. The problem is that people have been allowed to drive their cars right onto the beach. The visitor pressure is now so great that they've damaged the very thing they came to see. At the nearby Loch Garten, there has been little or no loss of bird life in spite of the very large number of visitors. No sailing is allowed. The loch side has not been interfered with and all cars have to be parked some way back from the water's edge. The land is owned by the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, who are concerned to minimise disturbance and prevent damage. Over a million visitors have now seen the osprey nest, yet Loch Garten remains unspoiled and the ospreys continue to breed successfully, attracting enormous interest. Many people regret that Loch Morlich wasn't given the same sort of protection. Well, it's a love-hate relationship with a fellow man, and I would agree with you that uh, given the choice of going to some remote, quiet loch, and going to Loch Morlich in a busy time, I would choose the, the quieter one myself. We showed him some recent photographs of the worst aspects of Loch Morlich and asked him what he thought. It could be improved, there's no question about it. You produce to be, as you would produce where there are large numbers of people, ugly ugly sights and you could say look this is this is a particularly ugly but it can be ugly to the people who enjoy it to be fair i agree that litter and various others should be removed it should be, it should have perhaps more attention given to to that particular aspect litter removal making things less ugly and um, but uh, but uh, your, your own conception of a place was probably in the past and therefore it was pleasurable in the past and you're upset that this has changed i would accept that I don't think it's been destroyed nearly as much as it could have been without, without controls. He's right, of course, it could be worse. But in such a beautiful area, should we not expect higher standards and more concern for the nation's heritage? In the Aviemore area, some people are keen to promote almost any commercial enterprise because it creates jobs. Go-karts in a highland village aren't welcomed by everyone, but there is a real fear of unemployment here as in many parts of the Highlands. The whole skiing development which took place was really started to prevent the winter unemployment which used to exist here really very badly indeed. And I think we have this history in the Highlands of a shortage of work, a shortage of jobs. It's difficult to make a livelihood. We have a, a history, almost tr a tradition now, of our younger people going off to the south or overseas to make a living, which people in the Highlands feel really very sorry about. But while tourism in Aviemore has boomed, not many of the new jobs have been taken by the local people who were out of work. In the tourist sector, 
A lot of the employment is actually to people who come into the area looking for jobs. They hear about the success of having all the all year round with, uh, tourist trade and they move in to uh, seek employment and to live in a better environment. And to be quite fair, the locals, especially the younger ones, are not particularly interested in being employed in the tourist industry. A recent survey showed that a majority of local people didn't favour further expansion in Aviemore, but wanted more ordinary jobs in the local communities. Providing better facilities for visitors in the countryside is one area of development. Nature reserves need guides, and on Deeside, there's a project to improve visitors' appreciation of the local countryside. It's run by the Braemar Civic Trust, with government funding. The Manpower Services Commission lads really have built all the, the new paths, and uh, without them, this just wouldn't have happened. Uh, it's very difficult to get people up here. We're very short of labour up here. And they have done a wonderful job. I could use people like this on a permanent basis. For the next ten years we could be building paths and improving them. And other opportunities could be stimulated throughout the area. There are quite a lot of jobs available. We have the uh, normal rural industries. We have farming and forestry. We've got whiskey distilleries. We've got light engineering. And we've got a lot of service jobs uh, servicing the local population, for instance, in shops and banks. But the most important local resource is the landscape itself. This is what brings most of the visitors to the Cairngorms. So how should this valuable asset be looked after? I think it's incredible that within Britain uh, we have this uh, quite unique habitat, this piece of the Arctic, and that we didn't make it a national park 30 years ago. I think it's fantastic, quite extraordinary that we failed to do that. And now it's more difficult because it's being used uh, for other, other purposes. It's more than 40 years since a government committee considered what was needed to conserve the best parts of Scotland. And the idea of a Cairngorms National Park was discussed. It's just after the war when planning was an in thing at that time and they felt that it would be possible to plan and work and develop a whole area if it was in one ownership. I'm very disappointed, of course, that the government didn't take it on at the time and make it a national park. Uh, it's one of the things that Scotland doesn't have. Probably the only country in the world without a national park. The atmosphere was always very good. At that time, uh, even the people politically opposed uh, uh, weren't antagonistic. Although, as you will see, there was an addendum at the end of their report which suggested how a national park might be planned and developed. But the plan was opposed by several interested parties, including the feudal landowners and the government. Yet, at the time, purchasing the Cairngorms for the nation would have cost just £200,000. I think that this is a very important area, environmentally, to, to preserve. And I, I think because of that, people are very much aware of this, and certainly we are on the estate. But um, I, I'm not sure I would altogether agree with the, the, the idea of making it into a national park. I, I, I think when you get a sort of bureaucratic um, hand in control from far away, you lack a flexibility perhaps and a personal approach to things. But um, it's not that one probably would disagree with some of the policies that, that um, govern the environmental approach. But I think there is an element of flexibility in, in the present system we have. One of the problems we have in our society is that the Westminster setup, with all due respect, is a bit biased towards those with property and those with land. But as well as the six major landowners, there are two regional councils, three district councils, and six central government bodies, all involved in managing the Cairngorms. It's not a formula likely to produce a unified management policy. Where you have single ownership, uh, citing, for example, the Nature Conservancy Council's reserve at Ben A in Wester Ross, which has won awards for its management because they own it all and can manage it with conservation first. Now, I, I can't see that uh, single ownership, public ownership preferably, of the whole Cairngorm area is an impossibility. There's no such thing as a, 
an area of the planet which is not unique. It's all, it's all unique, but we are concerned with employment, we're concerned with people's happiness, we're concerned with young people getting, uh, getting fresh air. And some of the conservation movement, I'm afraid, is, we don't mind me saying so, a class movement is saying we don't want these large numbers of hordes of people. The word is often used, the hordes of people, in enjoying our, our mountains, you see, our particular mountains. And uh, I don't regard uh, my fellow men as, as being hordes. Hordes of visitors, hordes of skiers, hordes of deer. There seems to be no political will to set limitations at all. But if numbers are to be related to carrying capacity and conservation needs coordinated with public access, some restrictions are inescapable if this national resource is to be secured for the future. Well, the main conclusion is that we shouldn't take our responsibilities here too lightly. The damage we are doing today could survive way beyond us. And it doesn't take too much disturbance to cause a fairly substantial amount of damage. This damage could be seen by our children and by our children's children. <laughs>